he died for our sins, amen, and rose again. If he, just, if he just died, we would be of all men most miserable, the Bible says, but he rose again, and now we have that resurrection power through Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit in us, and we're so thankful for it. Anybody thankful for the Spirit of God walking with you, being in you? Hallelujah. Matthew 26, verses 26 through 29. Matthew 26, verse 26 through 29. It's been an amazing week. I almost called one of the pastors and asked them to preach today um, because of a, a particular grief load that I'm carrying today, a mentor of mine, got a terminal illness diagnosis and I am believing the report of the Lord instead, I'll tell you that um, but I'm meeting with him at four to offload the management of a funeral home and I'm just last night I just sat in my vehicle and wept because this has been a mentor for me and as I wept my phone went off and there was a friend that wants to stay anonymous. And he said, the Lord told me to give your church this amount of money because I'm going to get with my lawyer. My wife told me not to say the number, of course, because she's so careful, and I appreciate her. But he said, you're going to find a building, and I'm going to pay for it. told him, I said, I have so much vision. I said, I want to set up a nonprofit called Heaven Sent where we sit with those in hospice where their families have rejected them and they got nobody to hold their hand. As I want to start a medical clinic where people can come in and get insulin when they can't afford it and the church takes care of it. It's going to take a million dollars. And he said, I, I was praying before I called you, and the Lord told me to give your church a million dollars. We remember you, Jesus. You went to the lost and the lonely. If we get this done before Jesus comes, it'll only be to his glory. It'll only be to his glory. He said, find a building, find some land. I'll get my lawyer. We'll draw up whatever we got to draw up to transfer the funds. But I believe in what I'm seeing. And I don't know when Jesus is coming back. I know it's soon. But I think God would rather have us go all the way in than sit back and say, no, we'll just hold, we'll just hold ground Hold what you got until he comes. No. We're going to hold what we got. But we're about to take on some, this county, this community, whatever we got to do to get Jesus into the hearts of people. He sent us. He's going to provide it. If it's his will, it's his bill. Remember that? So thank you for letting me take a moment to offload a little bit of emotion there. Let me preach the word here. It may go good. It may go bad. I don't know. But it's the word of the Lord, so it's forever settled. And it will not return void. Matthew 26, verse 26 through 28. If you're there, say amen. And as they were eating, this is the Last Supper, Jesus took bread and blessed it and break it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks. Everybody said he gave thanks. And gave it to them saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. 
But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. I just want to talk to you about something that's very important, whether you know it or not, remembering Jesus, remembering Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for a time of praise and worship. Thank you, Lord, that we could just sing praises humbly in your presence today. Thank you, Lord, for a move of the Holy Ghost in this room. Thank you, Lord, for tongues and interpretation to encourage your people. Let your word lift us up, I pray, in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. You may be seated in the house of the Lord. Has anyone ever done a review online, a good review? You've gone to a restaurant? Wave at me. You've done a restaurant review? All right. Maybe you don't want to raise your hand for the next one. Has anybody ever done a negative review online? <laughs> <laughs> Anybody done a negative review so bad it's almost criminal? Anybody? I mean, the food was horrible, and the service was out back having a smoke break or something, and just, there, was, there was nobody there, and, and you're like, someone's got to know. We, we have a story to tell. Did you know that? Everything we do, we have a story to tell, and, and giving your review online has now opened up this whole world where we can go online to a restaurant and we can look at the reviews and see if other people had good memories of being there. And they give reviews. And sometimes they give stars for this and sometimes the stars are, are, are not good. Sometimes the stars are not good, but the place is still good. That's always a good place to go if you know a good place to go, but it got some bad reviews because you're like, it'll just be us. We'll always get in. But Jesus wants us to give reviews, too, of his kingdom. If I could segue for a minute over to what God does in our life, he does so many great things, but we have to tell our story so that others can experience what we've experienced in Jesus. We have to, it's a strange thing in life. I guess because I'm a funeral director, I see it maybe more than others, but the greatest, the greatest thing that happens when someone is getting close to the end of life is A, they want to be around their family and the ones they love, and B, they want to be remembered. They want to be remembered. And sometimes people will set up things to be remembered, and they'll set up opportunities, and they'll do things before they get to the end of their life, and they're, they're wanting to be remembered. But Jesus sent his spirit, and he said, I'm going to go away, and the spirit's going to come back, and it's going to teach you all things. And, it's, and it's, also, it's also going to remind you of what's already been taught, because we have a propensity to forget in the emotion of the moment all the things that God has done for us. I don't know what that is, but we can forget Jesus. There are people that walked with Jesus on the earth for three and a half years of ministry, and they turned their back on the Lord in moments of emotional stress. Obviously, we know that Peter rejected God. He denied God three times. And then the rooster crowed, and, and he says, surely, surely I didn't do this. And he was just overcome with grief. But because of the moment, he forgot Jesus. Judas forgot Jesus and traded him in for 30 pieces of silver. And so we know it's possible even the people that walked with him on the planet can turn around and walk away. So all of us, no matter our generation, no matter where we come from, no matter what we've been through, we have to find ways to remember Jesus. We have to, in every generation, set up a word understanding or put the word of God in. I don't know how you're going to do that. Maybe you do a morning devotion. Maybe you use Dwell. Maybe you use a Bible app. Whatever you have to do, you need to put the word of God in your heart because Jesus is the word of God. He was the word made flesh. We know John 1, 1, right? In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And you get down a few, a few verses in 14, he said, and Jesus became the word. 
and dwelt among us. So when, when I'm talking about remembering Jesus, I'm also talking about remembering the Word of God. Because when you hide the Word of God in your heart, you will not sin against God. You set yourself up to be stronger in Him because the Word of God builds faith in you. Coming to hear the Word of God preaching, makes, making today a priority, whether you're young or old, builds your faith, and your faith builds your ability to stand in times of emotional strain and struggle. You have the opportunity to have the Word of God hidden in your heart, but also you can use the Word of God as a weapon. It's not just something that you store, but it's something that you use. When Jesus was sent into the wilderness, you know the story, by the Holy Spirit. Yes, the Holy Spirit sent Jesus into a trial. I know you think you're just dealing with struggles and trouble in your life, but maybe God sent you there for you to get something you need to get while you're there so that you can be stronger when you come up out of it. Maybe is designed to develop you, the trials, the struggles, the wilderness. And Jesus was sent into the wilderness by the Holy Ghost so that he could be tested. And he was tested, but he used the word of God every single time to recover and to counter the enemy. He said, I'm not living by bread alone. Every word should come out of the mouth of God. He's doing, he's doing all kinds of different things with Dealing with 40 days of fasting. Jesus had not eaten or drank for 40 days. And the enemy comes to test him at his lowest moment. Don't doubt the enemy's ability to come and test you at your lowest moment. He will wait. He will wait till you're at your lowest faith, at your lowest moment, and then he'll show up to give you the test. And I can tell you that when you pass those tests, the Bible says God's going to give you a crown of life. So we have to pass those tests. But you have to have the Word of God as ammunition. So you have to put the Word of God in you so that when you get in those moments, you can bring that out and use that against the enemy. Jesus used the Word of God in his testing moment. You know, I just saw that they had developed a Gen Z Bible. Have you seen this online? The Gen Z Bible. I don't care... Uh, now, understand, I have a great respect for the Word of God, but this is accurate according to Luke 1, okay? And maybe you've seen the reel on this online, but I pulled it off because I thought it was hilarious. However you get the Word of God in your heart, just get the Word of God in your heart is my point. And so all generations need to find a way to remember him. And here's, here's the Gen Z way of remembering Luke chapter 1 as the angel of the Lord communicates to Mary about having Jesus, the Son of God. He says, Mary was a pick-me girl for God and was simping for him in prayer. <laughs> when the angel Gabriel appeared to her and said, hey, yo, you're the real one, and the top G is feeling you. <laughs> but, she taught, but she thought his compliment was a little sus and gave him the side eye. So he said, baby girl, chill. God sent me to tell you, you've passed the vibe check, and low-key, he wants you to have the main character. You will name him Jesus, and they will all say he's him. She said, how can this be, since I promised him my body count would always be zero, respectfully? He said, this ain't about cuffing season, for the Holy Spirit will live rent-free, and your boy Jesus will be a divine bro. Beside, your cousin Elizabeth is with child. She is already older than a boomer, and her husband is way past beekeeping age. So Mary said bet, and Gabriel left her on red, and she let the Holy Ghost cook. <laughs> now, if you get in a trial and you start using that against the devil, it may not work. I'm just going to say it. But you also don't have to speak King James, thee and thou, to get the word of the Lord to help you. Amen? You, as long as you use his word, it's powerful. In Habakkuk, he's a lesser-known prophet, and a lot of times we don't read lesser-known prophets just for recreational reading. But in Habakkuk 2, he's talking, about, talking to the Lord. And a lot of prophets in the Old Testament would speak to the people for the Lord, but Habakkuk is known for speaking to God about the people. And he has this uh, argument, basically, with God, and his argument kind of stems over 
a couple of things. Number one is he doesn't like God's method, and he doesn't like God's timing. Have you ever been there? Where you don't like God's timing on his answer, and you really don't appreciate his method of how he's getting you to the answer, how you're dealing with it, but you're arguing with God and your spirit about it. Have you been there? Anybody want to be faithful, faithful and true? But the truth about it is that God would rather have us argue with him than walk away from him. God can handle your questions. He would rather have you argue your way through a prayer time with him than take, moment, take the moment and say, well, I guess, I guess God doesn't answer prayers and I, I'm just going to walk away. I'm going to be honest with you. There's really only two ways we respond to a prayer that's not answered or a trial that's in our life. We either deny that he's there and he's answering and that he cares or we just say this isn't working and we walk away. I brought a chart with me. This is, this is from a book, Seth Godin's book, The Dip, and this chart that they're going to put up if they can do that shows the beginning of when you meet God and when you fall in love with him. And then this, this dip in the middle is, is something that happens in every spiritual walk. It's where you start out and you just, everything's amazing. And, uh, and we like to talk with Sister it's all blue skies, and it's, uh, it's all beautiful, and the Lord's telling you what color shirt to put on, and you're, you're getting parking spaces at the front of the mall, and, and God's just doing amazing things, and you see Jesus in everything. Ever met a new convert? Anybody met a zealous Jesus convert? I mean, just everything is Jesus, and uh, that's okay. That's wonderful. I, I'm grateful for it. But then you hit a peak point where something happens or an offense comes or someone says something or you can't trust something or there's something that comes up in your life for ailment or sickness or prayer need or, or family or loss of loved one and you hit the dip, that second square. And that's where you have a low moment. Henry Blackaby called it the crisis of belief. And St. John of the Cross called it the dark night of the soul. The moment where you're at your lowest in your faith, where you've come to believe God and you know that he can do great things and you've seen him do great things and you've been at a peak moment where God has even answered prayers and done miraculous things for you, but then something has happened and it's drawn you down to the dip moment. It's what you do in that moment that changes everything. This is where Jesus was in the wilderness. He was in the lowest moment of his ministry. But you know, everything is a matter of perspective. At his lowest moment, he was actually being released for earthly ministry. And so there's something that we can learn from starting our spiritual journey with everything amazing, going through the troubles and drop, down into a moment where we feel like God's just maybe not even good anymore. If you want to be honest with me, you know you may have been in this moment, whether it was anxiety that got you there, worry that got you there, a situation, depression, whatever made it happen, you were in that moment. And the Bible tells us that Habakkuk, his name means to wrestle with God, that he wrestled with God for the people of God. And he didn't like the method of using the Babylonians to teach the people of God to turn their hearts back to him. He was like, I don't like that method. I don't like the time it's going to take. I don't like what you're doing with your people. But God used him, and God helped him. And in that moment, we see him wrestle with God until the upturn. There's going to be things that come into our life where we will not have an upturn from our faith moments that are low unless we remember what Jesus has done for us previously. And all throughout Habakkuk 3 in 16b, you can read it, that Habakkuk is saying, Lord, I remember your works. I remember what you've done. I remember how you brought your people out, how you saved from, to the uttermost, how you did all of these things. And he's telling God what he's done. It's okay to tell God his story. 
It's okay to say, God, if you brought people through a, through a Red Sea, you can bring me through this situation. You may not get the promotion. You may have difficulty. You may have struggles at the bottom of that dip. But God doesn't leave you there. He's going to pick you back up, and he's going to turn it around. And when it's done, it's going to be good. I don't know what the bottom of your dip is. I don't know if it's pain or if it's suffering or if it's a marriage that's suffering tension or if it's grief of loss or what it is. But tell your story anyways. Tell the high moments and tell the low moments. God's not afraid of the messy parts of your life. Hear me as I preach this. God will take the messy and he'll make it a powerful message to the next generation. He'll take your low moments and your high moments. He's not afraid of them. The moments you're dancing saying, God, you've been so good. And the moments where you can barely lift your head in moments of weeping and tears. God said, tell it. Tell it when you're down. Tell it when it doesn't feel good. Tell it when all you can do is barely lift your hands. But also tell it when there's nothing you feel greater than the power of God. Tell it when you feel like greater is he that is in me than he that's in the world. Tell it when you're up and tell it when you're down. He's not afraid of the weave and the story, highs and lows. The most painful part of your story can become might just be the most life-giving part of your story. The places where you've lost the most is where you should share your story. So in here we get honest. In here we do things that may seem different. But just as Jesus was in the wilderness, we have to go through some wilderness places. Amen? The Bible says that he is always with us. He'll never leave us and forsake us. And the Bible also tells us that we're not supposed to lean on our own understanding. That we're supposed to trust him in all our ways. And sometimes trusting Jesus in the low moments is difficult. But he's going to get us out. Amen? He brought us through. He saved us because of his cross. He came through the tomb. He's worthy of being praised. In Adam all die, Paul said. But in Christ, all will be made alive. He's going to honor that word. That's not a lie. In Christ, all will be made alive. And those that place their faith in him, those that walk through the waters of baptism, those that have been filled with the Spirit of God are given the understanding that they are able to walk into places that are spiritually toxic and be covered by the Lord. Even Satanists will tell you that when they try to pray against a Holy Ghost-filled believer, that there is some sort of blue aura around them. They cannot touch them. Their seances cannot reach them because they're protected by Almighty God. You are a child of God, and there are protections around your spirit and your life that you can't even understand. I know whereof I speak, because he's helped my soul, my mind, my body, my emotions so many times. Thursday night, I was laying in bed, Halloween night, and I went to bed early. I worked about 90 hours this week. It's been so crazy. And... Uh, I, I'm not saying that for, you, for your sympathy. I, I, I know that there's moments where I have peaks and lows, just like the graph. <laughs> and uh, I went to bed, and I was dreaming. And I started being shook. I just was being shaken. And um, there's a spirit that entered my room. I, I, you may believe this, you may not. But there's a spirit that entered my room. And I was being shaken in my bed, and my whole body went with chills. If you know, anytime you experience it, you have a physical experience with a spirit, sometimes you'll get chills. And my whole body went ice cold, and I had just sudden chills. And I came out of the dream saying, Jesus, and it left my room. I don't know what it was, but I'm telling you, we have pushed on something. In the last few days, we've pushed on something. And there's going to be flesh rise up. Yes, there will be. But the spirit is greater than flesh. I'm believing that the power of God is still going to move us forward. And it was that next day that I got the call that said, we're going to buy a building. 
And I'm not into building. Don't get me wrong. I, I understand that, that if you get a superstar on a stage in a big building, that's not sustainable. We don't need that. You can share the word of God house to house in Scripture. We know that. And in fact, you see more of this in Scripture that the plan can't be one great pastor with hundreds of thousands of people. That can't be the plan because too many of those pastors have fallen into immorality and different things. But the plan can be microchurch. We can have a base and send. We can have a place where we not only seat people, but also where we send people. Amen? I don't want this church to ever be more than 100 if God doesn't want it to be. But I want to sin 5,000. I want to sin 20,000 if we can. I don't know that we can, but maybe God can. But we're not going to sit everybody just to listen to me share a sermon every Sunday. We're going to send everyone as a minister into the gospel field. We're going to send them into wheat fields and harvest fields where it's already white. And there's souls that I'm talking about right now that need Jesus. They need to be filled with the Holy Ghost. They need spiritual discernment. If you walk into a place and you feel chills, it may not be that you're walking into an air-conditioned room. It may be that the Holy Holy Ghost is quickening you that there's a spirit in that room. Some of us need to know that the Holy Ghost in us is what gives us the discernment of spirits. I had people tell me, well, when someone walked up, I felt chills. I knew it was the Holy Ghost. I'm, I'm grateful for that. I am. I am grateful for that. But I can also feel chills whenever an opera singer walks on stage. I can feel chill, chills whenever an orchestra hits a high note. That's emotional high. You can feel that because it's spirit. Music is spirit. Can you touch music? You can't touch it. It's spirit to spirit interaction. So when you walk into a room, you need the Holy Ghost. When you walk into situations where there's spiritual discernment needed, you need the Holy Ghost to tell you whether it's a good spirit or not a good spirit. That's why we encourage in feeling of the Holy Ghost speaking with tongues here because you need to know what's going on when you walk into places. And so I knew when I woke up that that wasn't a spirit that I wanted in my room. I came out of my sleep calling on Jesus, and I still had chills all over my body. I remember my friend Brad Boyvin, he, uh, about 12 years ago, he taught me something so powerful, maybe even almost 15 years ago now. I'm not always really great with the numbers, but I know it happened in the past, okay? He, we went to a concert at Fox River Church. It was already here. We went to a concert at Fox River Church. And it was a powerful concert. The, the Spirit of God moved in the concert, and we were all worshiping. I can't remember the artist at the moment. And we got back in his car, and his, his little, like, I think it was a Cavalier, his little Cavalier. And, and we were driving back to my house, and he said, you know, it's very dangerous to take chills and call that the Holy Ghost. Because if you don't have the Holy Ghost to discern whether that's God or another spirit, you might misinterpret what's going on in the moment based upon how they've raised the music, how they've elevated the moment, how they've put emotion in the room. Be careful because you need the Holy Ghost to discern whether that's God or that's just emotional hype. So I was like, do you have a story? He's like, yeah. He goes, I went to a Michael English concert. Anybody remember Michael English? Oh, that's a throwback. Some of you don't even know what I'm talking about. Michael English was one of the greatest voices in early Christian music. Just a phenomenal voice. And Brad used to love to sing it. I'm sorry to reference this, sister, but I need to use this for this to, to make sense. He said, I went to a concert with Michael English and for him, he goes, and the Holy Ghost was thick in the room. We were worshiping God. We, were, we had goosebumps on our goosebumps. We had chicken skin everywhere. And I'm like, what? what do you mean? He goes, we, there was just a move of God in the room. He goes, and that next week, Michael English got up and sang. He goes, and it was powerful. He goes, and that next week it came out that Michael English was having an affair with the beautiful girl in the For Him band while they were traveling. And he was like, I was blown away. 
I was like, how could we have so much Holy Ghost in the room? How could I have goosebumps on goosebumps and this man is not living right? He comes out and his songs were anointed. How is that possible? I prayed about it. And God told me I was honoring the faith of the people that were worshiping me, not the life that the man was living. I met the people who lifted up their hands to praise with a song, regardless of how the singer was living. You need the Holy Ghost to discern that kind of stuff. That's why we encourage, we remember what Jesus said. We remember how he directed us and guided us. And after that, I took that away. That's one of the greatest lessons I learned from my friend Brad. Is that just because you feel goosebumps, you better make sure you have the Holy Ghost to know if that, if that God honoring my faith or is that an anointing on that man or woman singing? Or is God just honoring the faith in the room? We were at a conference and we were standing in a row and my friend who is very gifted in discerning spirits had somebody walk up and stand right next to me. He said, it was like the gentleman sucked the spirit out of the room next to me. And he has a lot more knowledge in this than I do. And I'm not trying to get off into left field here, but I want you to know that you need to have the Holy Ghost so that you can discern the down moments so that when you're down, you can pray in the Holy Ghost, building yourself up in your most holy faith, the Scripture says. And so I feel like God is telling us today that we need to remember him. And we're going to move into communion right now, and this won't take very long at all. But there's a famous Chinese proverb that says the faintest of ink is stronger than the greatest of memories. That sometimes you need to write your story down. And I know I've said that to so many people, friends of mine in this room. When they have something happen in their life that's life-changing or miracles that happen, I say, get a journal. Write it down. You're going to forget the nuances. You're going to forget the amazing things and the way that God wove that miracle into your life. Write it down because the faintest of ink is stronger than the greatest of memories. But Jesus is saying, I'm going to send my spirit, and it's going to help you remember me. And he said, when you take communion, we need to understand that we're marking our life when we take communion. And we're saying, God, I remember how you died on that cross. I remember how you suffered the worst torture device ever made by Romans. I remember how that was my cross, but you took it for me. I remember how you paid all of my debts. I do not have to do anything because you paid it all for me. I will take the gospel and I will obey the plan of salvation. I will walk in faith and repentance. I will walk in a newness of life through baptism and I will live and discern the day in which I live and the spirits that are around me through the power of the Holy Ghost. That is the life that he wants us to live. So today, we mark his life by remembering him. Would you stand with me today? We're going to take communion together. and The scripture tells us that we should not take it unworthily. What that means is you need to be respectful. But I want to take a moment, and would you just help me? We're going to pray in just a minute. And as we pray, we're going to ask the Lord to forgive us of any sins and ask the Lord to touch us. But what I want to do, Brother Steve, would you take the communion and stand here? And I'd like for everyone on this side to come down and take communion and go back that way. And everyone on this side to come down and take communion that wants to and go back that way. And we're going to do that right now, if you would. Would you step out and come and take communion? I would tell you, this is, we do not believe in transubstantiation. We do not believe when we take communion that it becomes the literal body and blood of Christ. What Jesus was meaning when he said that was that you're going to do this. It still stays grape juice. It still stays the wafer. It doesn't change. But what we're doing is we're remembering that he had his body broken for us on that cross. 
and that he shed his blood for us. And without the shedding of blood, Hebrews says, there is no remission of sins. And, and God, needed, God needed a body because we were supposed to die in the, in the garden. We were supposed to be the ones who died, but Jesus came and died for us. And so because his body was broken and because, and because his blood was poured out, we can be saved. These have the wafer at the bottom. You can go ahead and begin to peel that. Hold it upside down and just peel that out. And once you have the bread out of the bottom, you can peel the top carefully to get to the juice. In 1 Corinthians 11, 24 and 25, another account just like Matthew 26, 26 through 29. Scripture says, and when he had given thanks, he break it. Thank you, Stephen. You can just leave them there. And when he had given thanks, he break it, the bread, and said, take, eat, this is my body. Not yet, but we'll do, to, we'll do this all together. Which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. You see, in Scripture, communion doesn't save you. That's a religious construct that was built around a traditional religion. That if you take communion, you're going to heaven. God says in his word, you take communion to remember what I've done for you. And so this is done in reverence. It's done in awe. But it's also done not to save us, but to remember who saves us. After the same manner, he also took the cup. When he had supped, saying, this is the cup of the New Testament of my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink in remembrance of me. Communion serves to remind us that we are to remember the agony of the cross, the awful price Jesus paid to save our souls. And he died in our place and suffered greatly when he did. And number two, we are to remember what he achieved. He paid the price for, of death. But three days later, he resurrected by the power of the Holy Spirit. And he is living and alive. And number three, we are to remember his soon return. Someone said amen. His soon return. And when he returns for his church, that's us, he will fully complete what he came to earth to do. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six 26 says, For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye show or ye do show the Lord's death till he comes. When we lift our cup and our bread today, we're saying, he died for us. He died for me. And you remember that that was your cross, but he carried it for you. That was your debt, and he paid it for you. When we participate in communion, we are declaring and showing our faith in the death, burial, and resurrection and soon coming return of Jesus. It is a witness to those who observe it. When we do this, it's a witness to others. Before we take part in the Lord's Supper, though, let's do this. We need to search our hearts and confess and repent our sins. Psalms 139 says this. It says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let's take a moment with the cup in your hand and the bread and say, Lord, forgive me. Would you pray with me? Lord God, forgive me. I repent of any sins in my life. I ask you to cleanse my heart and cleanse my life of any selfishness, anything I've done or said. Help me, Lord, to remember you today, that you're the only one that could take my burden away. In Jesus' name. We're going to take the communion together. I will tell you when. Luke twenty two nineteen 19 says, And he took bread, 
and gave thanks and break it and gave unto them saying, this is my body which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. Take the bread in your hand, break it in your hand, and think of his body that was broken for you as you eat it. Likewise also the cup after supper saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood which is shed for you. Take the juice and drink it, thinking of Jesus' blood that was shed to cleanse us from our sins. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Would you take a moment and just entertain the Lord? Just have a thankfulness in your spirit right now. He took my sin. He took all of my shame. He made a way for me. Would you pray right now? Just pray. Thank you, Jesus. you sing this with us? If you have cups left over, you can bring them and leave them here. And your hand <clears throat> 